In 1953, U.S. President Eisenhower was being transported on the Columbine 2, a Lockheed BC-121A LO constellation at the call signal Air Force 8610, when an Eastern Airlines commercial flight with the same flight number crossed its path and set off confusion between the pilots and the ground. During the chaos, the 8610 call sign was mixed up by controllers, and it became clear to all involved that the lack of distinction for the President's aircraft could result in a terrible accident. The Secret Service convened once the plane had landed and decided to implement a special new call sign for the President's plane. From then on, it would be known as Air Force One. The Roosevelts and the First Presidential Planes The first U.S. President to fly in an aircraft was Theodore Roosevelt, who did so after his presidency had ended. He flew on an early Wright Flyer, one of the very first working, heavier-than-air powered planes. The flight was brief, only taking him over a crowded affair. Yet it marked the beginning of change. Presidents used to stay in the capital, rarely traveling across the country, and even less often traveling overseas before World War II. With no wireless phones and the only relatively reliable and safe option of using railroads, presidents were stuck in the District of Columbia, only visiting nearby states once in a while. In 1936, with signs of the coming war starting to show in Europe, American Airlines inaugurated their passenger service with the Douglas DC-3 airliner, opening aircraft to civilian use. All metal airplanes with improved navigation and trustworthy engines started being introduced to civilians, making air travel accessible for the first time to elite commercial travelers and top or middle top government officials. The DC-3 was the first to trace many of the air routes in the US and for the first time made flying worldwide possible. The aircraft has gone down in history as one of the first to profitably, safely, and reliably carry passengers as primary cargo. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the first president to fly while in office, although his first trip would be with Pan Am. At the time, a Douglas Dolphin amphibian, modified with luxury fixtures, was set for transporting the president from 1933 until 1939, but there are no written records of him actually using it. With German U-boats prowling the Atlantic and disrupting ship traffic, Roosevelt did, however, eventually fly on a Pan Am flying boat to Morocco for the Casablanca Conference in 1943. The Army Air Force ordered a C-87 VIP transport aircraft to be modified in order to transport the President, particularly on international flights, as flying commercial presented a number of challenges and could not accommodate for the needs of a President. The first plane, nicknamed Guess Where 2, was rejected after completion due to safety concerns. The C-87A was an alternative version of the B-24 Liberator bomber, and the Army Air Force worried that allies or adversaries might have felt uneasy due to its presence. The plane was still put to use transporting high-profile members of the administration, including Eleanor Roosevelt, who was flown on it to several Latin American countries during a 1944 Goodwill tour. Still, the plane was scrapped one year later. The Secret Service then modified a Douglas C-54 Skymaster to transport the President. The plane was given the moniker Sacred Cow, and featured small sleeping quarters, radio, a telephone, and an elevator to provide accessibility using the president's wheelchair. Roosevelt only flew on it once, to the Yalta Conference, where he met with Stalin and Churchill only months before he passed away. National Security Act of 1947 Vice President Harry S. Truman ascended to the presidency when Roosevelt passed away in 1945. Truman signed into law the National Security Act of 1947, legislation which, among other things, created the United States Air Force, separating the Army Air Forces into a distinct service. The act also established the CIA, the first American intelligence agency for peacetime and non-military intelligence. The bill was signed while Truman was flying on the VC-54C, which was retired in 1947 for a modified C-118 liftmaster named the Independence in honor of his hometown in Missouri. The C-118 received a makeover in order to enter the service of the President, including an exterior custom repainting with the head of the plane meant to resemble a bald eagle. A stateroom was designed in the place of the previous aft fuselage. The main cabin could host 24 passengers on seats or 12 on sleeper berths. The plane was sent to the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Ohio after it was retired. The Columbine II The next presidential plane, introduced for President Dwight D. Eisenhower was the Columbine II. It was originally built at Burbank, California by Lockheed Aircraft in full cargo configuration as C-121A and was finished by November 22, 1948. Upon completion, it was sent to Iceland to support a Lockheed maintenance facility. Under its original configuration, the aircraft required a crew of five and could hold 44 passengers. 
It counted on four Wright R3350 duplex cyclone supercharged air-cooled radial engines with 18 cylinders allowing for a cruising speed of 324 miles or 521 kilometers per hour and a maximum density altitude of 24,442 feet or 7,450 meters. Upon receiving the request to provide a military VIP transport aircraft in November of 1949, the plane was returned to Burbank, converted to a VIP configuration, and given the model number VC-121A. In February of 1950, it was sent to the U.S. Air Force, so the 1,254th Squadron could operate it to transport the Secretary of the Air Force. Later assigned for presidential transport, Eisenhower named it the Columbine II, after the official flower of Colorado, where First Lady Mamie Eisenhower had grown up. The number two was given to the aircraft, as the Columbine I had been the name Eisenhower gave to his personal transport while he served in the Army. The botanical name of the plant actually means the Eagle, further connecting it to American imagery. It should be noted that the plane was not named until much later, in 1953. The then-president-elect Eisenhower took his first flight on Columbine II in November of 1952. The Columbine II took him overseas at the end of November for a Far East tour that year as part of a commitment show to his campaign promise of ending the Korean War. Starting in January of the following year, the plane was given the call sign 8610. From 1953 to 1954, the plane had the President on board for 259 hours and 13 minutes, covering a total distance of 63,844 miles. Air Force One the call sign Air Force One is now officially used to designate any plane carrying the President of the United States, and is informally used to refer to specially fitted aircraft used to transport the President. It was first used under Eisenhower's presidency. According to aviation historian Robert Spears, the designation was first discussed after the President was on an out-and-back trip to North Carolina, where he gave a speech for the Charlotte Freedom Celebration Day, during which he honored service members and remarked on the 1775 Mecklenburg Convention. Pilot Colonel Bill Thomas was reportedly at the helm when he checked in with air traffic control to let them know Air Force 8610 was on air, when another flight labeled Eastern 8610 from Eastern Airlines asked if air traffic control was calling them. The resulting confusion nearly led the airplanes to cross flight paths and brought to light the issue of needing the President's flight number to be unmistakable. Upon landing in Washington, D.C., Secret Service agents met with the presidential pilot and Air Force aide to the president, Colonel Bill Draper, to determine what the president's aircraft call sign should be. The designation Air Force One was created by suggestion of Draper and was adopted for all other air transportation that the president could be on, such as Marine Corps aircraft, Army aircraft, and Navy aircraft. This created Marine One, Army One, and Navy One, respectively. The first Air Force One itself was replaced in 1954 by the Columbine Three which had been made from a Super Constellation aircraft, an upgrade in speed, comfort, and fuel efficiency. The Columbine II continued to be used by the Air Force until the late 1960s, when it was sent to the Davis Mountain base for storage. The plane was subsequently sold to Mel Chrysler, who owned a crop dusting company, along with several other planes during a military surplus auction in 1970. It's the only presidential aircraft ever sold to a private entity. Chrysler planned to scrap it and turn it into a crop dusting plane. He almost did but the Smithsonian contacted him while doing research into presidential aircraft, and the patriotic rancher and business owner decided it should be preserved and restored. The plane had value in his eyes, not only for its role in aviation history, but in the history of the Eisenhower presidency. It's been reported that his Adams for Peace speech, delivered to the General Assembly of the United Nations on December 8, 1953, was written on the plane as he traveled from Bermuda, where he had met with Winston Churchill and French Premier Joseph Laniol, to New York. Reports claim that the plane was allegedly kept in the air for an additional 30 minutes after reaching LaGuardia so he could finish composing his speech. When Chrysler did not have the funds needed to restore the plane, he tried to auction the plane. After finding no suitable offers, he decided to hold the plane, attempting to keep it as free from decay as he could. In the pursuit of restoration, he persisted, and with help from Wyoming rancher Harry Oliver, was finally able to restore it in 1990. The plane was in flying conditions for the celebration of Eisenhower's 100th birthday, and was flown to an air show at the Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland as part of the 1989 celebrations. After rediscovery by Carl Stoltzfus in 2015, it was purchased by his company Dynamic Aviation and transported in March of 2016 to Bridgewater, Virginia from Arizona. The sale was undisclosed, but Stoltzfus has claimed it was less than the $1.5 million asking price. Mechanics from Dynamic Aviation worked extensively on restoration efforts before sending it to Bridgewater, and the following restoration efforts will reportedly take years. Stoltzfus has stated that, quote, It's an airplane with an incredible amount of history. At the end of the day, 
It's an airplane that should be preserved for the public to appreciate.